Welcome to uh, Almost Cooperstown episode with David Metter, Cooperstown Dave, and we love a guy that has Cooperstown in his name because so do we. So, yeah, it's uh, my first name. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're happy to have Dave join us and, and following his tweets and, and the conversations online all the time, uh, like where you come from a lot. And, and so we thought that because you had an interesting take on Rule B, we would sort of center the conversation today around Rule B Hall of Fame candidates, which is a bit of a sort of a corner a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting because I think most people are aware out there that obviously you can get in through the standard Hall of Fame voting ceremony. But then to most people, if you ask them what Rule B is, I think they would actually just think it's like the Veterans Committee sort of as like option B. But no, there is the Veterans Committee. And then there is this third way, which is Rule B. And Dave, can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, you're right. Uh, so to your point, Gordon, there's the Baseball Writers Association of America manner of getting in, which is only for players and only recent players, more or less, to put it simply. Then there's the era committees, they call it now, the Veterans Committee. There's been other names. And there's really three rules that surround how that committee works. And that committee, depending on the year, inducts players, managers, umpires, and executives. And then there's this fuzzy other part of the executive group where pioneers come in. Like, for example, I mean, Buck O'Neill got in. I'm not sure you'd call him a pioneer, necessarily executive is kind of strange i think buck o'neill will probably find that an interesting way but um the three rules so rule c there's a b and c rule c is if you're ineligible you're not eligible so <laughs> that's, pretty simple <laughs> yeah that's a good one just to keep in mind rule a dictates eligibility things about uh players have to have played 10 years when they become eligible managers and umpires had to have worked at least in 10 seasons and been retired for X number and same with executives. But rule B is where there's this opportunity to identify other Hall of Famers based on, I'll, I'll use the word like multidimensional, that there's a multidimensional way of viewing the Hall of Fame uh, candidates. Even though we struggle enough when you're comparing like two shortstops from the same era, the same league. So rule B says, those whose careers entailed involvement in multiple categories will be considered for their overall contribution to the game. Uh, however, the specific category in which they are to be considered will be determined by the role in which they are most prominent. So what that tells me is, for one thing, will be considered for their overall contribution. So if you're picked as a man you're uh, identified mostly as a manager because that's where you were quote most prominent your playing career can be added value into your overall hall of fame case for example mm -hmm. and so that rule exists one thing I, I need to find out is when did that rule come into play but even when you read up on the hall of fame's history this sort of notion of overall baseball impact has really been a part of the conversation since the beginning so not only is it in rule, but there's also a lot of precedent for it in existing Hall of Famers and other other things you see around the Hall of Fame that I think make it very real. It's not like finding a weird, obscure little law. So that's what the rule is. Well, that's what you said, Gordon, isn't it? Though, a little well, no, no, it, I don't think. I, I think. I think if you're looking at it, it, it still applies to a very a large swath of guys. Because right now, you could think of a bunch of managers in the MLB, both guys that have been managers for a long time, and you know, new managers that were former MLB players of varying degrees of success, depending on who the manager is. But for some of those guys, they definitely weren't a player that would have ever been in the Hall of Fame. But they might be a manager one day and do the if they're only being evaluated on the contributions of the managerial job, does anything from their playing career come in or vice versa? You know, what about a guy was that was a player manager back when that used to happen? Does he get bonus credit, essentially? Right. And or um, in the earlier days of baseball, a lot of the umpires were former players. You really don't see that anymore. But, no. um, <laughs> for example, uh, Hank O'Day is a Hall of Fame umpire. Now, his career, he probably had a Hall of Fame umpiring career anyway, but he's somebody who had a very respectable playing career. Um, and to that point, just there are existing Hall of Famers who 
maybe as you were describing, don't have a full Hall of Fame case in any individual category. Al Lopez is in the Hall of Fame. He's in ostensibly like as a manager. And I'll get to that because at the end of the day, all the plaques are together. The plaque doesn't say this person got in as a manager. The umpire's plaques are next to the players. So I think that also informs this idea of like, let's stop focusing in such very narrow ways. But he won two pennants as a manager and zero World Series, which is as lean as it gets for Hall of Fame managers. Uh, no Hall of Fame manager has uh, won, you know, won zero World Series and only one pennant. They've all won multiple pennants. Um, and then as a player, he was a 16 war player, but as a catcher, which as I'm sure you're aware, you know, you, you give that a little bump 16 at, as a catcher is a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and again, of course, uh, he's 28th in managerial wins, but probably when he retired, he was a bit higher than that. And he was an all-star a couple times, but as a manager or as a player, probably not getting in, but he got in. And there's several others uh, who I think fit that bill. All of this kind of, you know, I, I think, I think you feel somewhat like we do with that. Look, there's room for more people in the Hall of Fame. We're not talking about adding. And we've had our our thing where we add 36 players and it doesn't, you know, dilute it as much as people. It'll ruin the Hall of Fame. So the idea that we're looking at, at folks that were overlooked for contributions they've made to the game. Right. And so Gordon and I were talking about this before we, we got on. And, and and it's really hard because we, we, we talked, we pulled out Tommy John as we as we began talking and going, well, gee, you know, he wasn't even the guy that performed the surgery. Right. He was the guy that had the surgery now he did win 280 games or something like that is it so so that when it meant something to win 280 games being the winning pitcher was a little bit more important at the time was tommy john a great major league pitcher you can argue it both ways. He's right on, on the borderline. But the fact that his contribution to big, you, all you say is tommy john and everybody knows what you're talking about well that's the definition of being famous <laughs> right. But when so Dr. Frank Job is who did the surgery right. and people will argue that he should maybe. But, you know, when it comes to the fact that Tommy John's name got attached to it, Dr. Job also innovated an important shoulder surgery that many players get. But the first person to get it was Oral Hershiser. <laughs> and maybe the mouthful of a name impacts Tommy John. I mean, Tommy John's a snappy, nice little name. And yeah, you say TJ, and if people know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think almost if you really wanted to do it correct, you just put them on a joint plaque. You put a Dr. Frank Job right. and Tommy John on a plaque together, and because you couldn't have one without the... Yeah. Tim McCarver used to say, um, you know, that, that he was one of the patients of Job, uh, and 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 that that was a uh, you know a, a real a, a funny line at, at the time. He was doing everybody, uh, Doctor Job, in terms of you know his you know uh, surgery. I mean, he was he basically was getting he was the guy to go to. There are different guys now, so um, yeah. And the Rule B guys, and and I think we lost Gordon for a second here. I think he might have froze. So. Um, you know, you talk about you're going to talk I mean, about you some manage, managers and things of that nature. Um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about you know how you you look at the situation today uh, c compared to the way that you used to. Um, when it comes to a manager, yeah. So, um, you know, one thing we have upcoming this cycle is uh, a non-players ballot. Um, in other words, the era committee that's convening is specify uh is focused on people whose most prominent contributions are either manager, umpire or executive and that the primary uh part of their career occurred after 1980 which is a very very slim group because especially when you think about the fact that uh, I think it's next year or the year after it's every category from the beginning of time to 1980 like all grouped together Wow. Because there's just three groups. There's those two I described and then uh, players only post-1980. So, yeah, I mean, you could say there's a 19th century player who's going to be on the same competing uh, against, you know, a 70s player versus a 50s man. Like, uh, so anybody who can make this ballot, like, that's a very nice opportunity for them because it's... The field just gets so much bigger after this one that if you're not in that post-1980... And... and... The flip side happens in that 1980s bracket is going to get really pinched because I think it's 16 years now. Like, like there's like a, a long period of time before new people are going to show up on that ballot. So there's only so many people that are going to be on it for a while. Yeah. And the um, the managers, realistically, 
the pre-1980 managers who are mer- probably meritorious and not in is a very, very short list. Especially, I mean, there's a couple from the Negro Leagues who are extremely worthy. But otherwise, it's been very uh, combed over. Gene Mock, it, I believe, has the most wins of any pre-1980 manager who's not in. But he didn't win much of anything in the playoffs and doesn't have the best reputation. <laughs> but um, it, there are certainly great managers who are will be eligible this year who are not in. Probably the top of the list will be Lou Pinella. Who, he he um, only has he only has one right so that's you got it so you're you're adding what I think in his case was a better playing career than most of the other managers so that's it, it's sort of it, it it's more level than some of the other guys I think you, very good catch um yes that's one of the more that's something to note about his candidates yes he will set a new precedent for fewest penance I like to look at that when I look at the Hall of Fame um be, like people who may follow my account know I've got some opinions about relievers largely due to their usage and that the we keep we uh, increasingly as we elect relievers it's like there's a new low in innings pitched per pitcher but Pinella for one thing yeah he's got a, a nice bit of value from his playing career but I think when you think about the fewer pennants um, the expansion of the league certainly makes it quite a bit harder to win multiple mm-hmm. pennants when it was I'm a manager of a team and there's seven other teams in my league com- I'm competing against. So yeah. I think if for no other reason, that's where like I see it being really reasonable to flex that president. Does Davey Johnson fall into that same category as Pinella sort of, you know, had a good playing career. I wouldn't say great. Uh, only won the one pennant in world series, just like Lou Pinella. Yeah. I would, I mean, I have Davey as more or less the second best manager who might make a, uh, this ballot after Pinella. He's also been on several of these era committee ballots, which mm-hmm. suggests to me that the people who make up the ballots feel favorable towards him. I think he's got a nice reputation. He's well liked. Um he also uh, was like an early proponent of on base percentage. And um he's just a, a bit he has a reputation as a bit more forward thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah and yeah. one of the things I care a lot about and just to put it out there because I think others do too is it's really great when we can elect people while they're alive. Oh, I, so, I, I, you've said that before, I, and I totally agree with you. It's like, get them while you can uh, and have that moment. Right. It feels too much like we're correcting a mistake, you know, when it's po- po- posthumous. You know, some obviously there's sometimes where it's unavoidable, but th- those should really be the only cases, ideally. We shouldn't need 50 years back to look on somebody's career and be like, oh, wait, they were actually pretty good, especially now that we're so much better with the advanced stats at evaluating these things. Yeah, and there's there's been cases, ah, blanket on a good name, not Willie Keeler, but like going way back where it's like, oh, it wasn't until a year after, because then as a result of the death, it's like people start to pay more attention. Right. But Ron Santos, the one everyone, a lot of people talk about. I mean, Dick Allen's, I think, going to get in soon, but, you know, unfortunately he's I gone. So. Yeah. Minoso, et cetera. So, um, you know, in addition, to, and, and Johnson, I noticed Davey Johnson had a 500 record or better with every team he ever managed. And 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 I think that's significant, right? He, he Not that he didn't have a losing season because he had a couple of short uh, losing seasons. But, but he was a winning manager wherever he went. And that, that says something about his managerial career because you don't, I mean, that means it's organizationally independent. He's good where he goes. And, yeah, and I'm the, not sure other than Connie Mack if there's someone sub 500. <laughs> but when you, when you own the team, you get to manage for a long time. And when you manage, years. <laughs> yeah, when you manage for a long time, you're going to lose a lot of games. But yeah, I at least I have that. Um, Dave, I mean, he's like got a 562 winning percentage, which is very high. It's not even just over 500. And there's only uh, only five have more wins at a higher percentage, and they're all in the hall. I'm sure I don't have it written down what's the minimum games for that, but that's a very high winning percentage. And yeah, he doesn't have like a bunch of World Series wins. He's got the one, but um, I but think he's got he the one. Liked. That's also the thing. He's got the one. He should have had two. Those, <laughs> but it makes those arguments a lot easier. It, it gets hard if, like, if Pinella or him didn't have that World Series. Oh yeah, it, and the argument gets so much harder. Yeah, and then the other probably similar level name would be Jim Leland, who hasn't been on a ballot yet. Um, but he's got three pennants and he won one World Series, won a whole lot of games. Um, 
you know, it wouldn't be a travesty relative to the others in, I mean, the, the, the bar for a manager is very high, obviously. I forget mm-hmm. the number. It's like 22, so 22 or, so. or something like that manager that, in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got to think like, you know, how many per era are you putting in? But um, after him, I think you got fewer options. Tom Kelly was on a committee ballot once. Um, you got because he won two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yet Cito Gaston hasn't been on any, and yet he also is the first African American manager to win, which I think he really deserves a little bit more. Uh, you know, light on him. Do you think that would give give him a big push to be in the Hall of Fame? Because that, that seems like something no- noteworthy that you'd want to celebrate. Yeah, and it's it's interesting how he didn't manage elsewhere after that run. I think he came back later with or before. I don't, I don't right. think he. I think that was his first job with the Twins. Well, that that brings up one of the issues. I, I've become pretty passionate about Felipe Alou's candidacy, and um, I've heard people suggest the the concept that we think about with Negro League players, where it's like maybe their numbers in totals. Um, don't pop out. But when you think about that, their careers were stymied by or slowed by an uh, inability, uh, not being able to get the chance to play. Um, many kind of believe that Felipe Alou would in other circumstances would have managed earlier when he, when he was younger, but because of race, it was delayed. And um, that's a shame because he's made a tremendous impact. He's an interesting hall of fame case because how do you exactly identify his primary category? Because the first thing you do with these committees is where did they have their most value per these categories? And then you can fit it in against the timeline of like pre or post 1980. But, you know, he didn't have playoff success as a manager. Um, you know, in any individual category, he's probably not a Hall of Famer. So he's a case like that where it's more the combination of cat- categorical value. Um and it's there's really like a an element to him that's I don't know Buck O'Neill's the only name that comes to mind, but like his impact amongst Dominican players is tremendous, and um, he seems like he paved the way for a lot of Latin American players as a uh, mentor. And um, well, I, you know, I hope he gets a look. He's you know one I, I, they're you know the three Alu brothers, and he's the I believe the oldest of the three, and probably the best player of the three Maddie I know won a batting title but but Felipe of oh, his the body of the work of his career I think was a little stronger in fact I think his son Moises might have been the better ball player just if mm-hmm. not for injury mm-hmm. um, but all of those guys you know I, I think contributed as a family and the, I, I could make a case that the Alou family is something that you could put in the Hall of Fame as you know you might put the Boone family as we recently you know did a Father's Day you know podcast where we talked about the three generations of the boons and, and and there's room for that in the hall of fame because we're talking about fame and history and, and i think that that's a really good way to look at it because i think what you were bringing up there dave with the idea of like the contribution felipe alu made with bringing dominican players and and the outreach to the latin american community that what what this really should be about is trying to quantify some of the things that literally cannot show up in the stat sheet that you can't look at this and be like oh yeah it was worth you know 6.0 war in 1956 but had an undeniable impact on the game because we can see that otherwise and you can't say that people that do things like that don't belong in the hall of fame because then we wouldn't have hall of fame fame owners otherwise because that's why hall of fame owners are in there because of the things that they did outside the game that impacted it yeah and that's one of those things i often think about and debate with others and in my own head is like let's say a team wins a bunch of pennants it's like okay there's probably gonna be players who get in the hall of fame for it the manager's probably getting the hall of fame i don't know even think about those braves teams that only won one world series but then Sherholtz gets in cox is in players are in like, how much do we give credit to everybody in the organization? Like, well, does the traveling secretary get in? Like, does, does I think Ted when the Braves get win, in? When the Braves win like fourteen division championships in in sixteen years, that's a that's a stronger case than just winning. I mean, that they were not just good; they were excellent at the top. And so, that's a tough one to call because we're not Braves fans here on this podcast. Everybody knows that. No, but. But the idea that that's that's just crazy. If my team had won 14 out of 16 or whatever it was, I'd be crawling from the top of the mountain. Yeah, as a, a child of the 90s growing up in, as a Phillies fan, it's, a, it's honestly amazing how much like 
you'd think I'd like hate those Braves, but they were just so respectable and good and you couldn't hate them. <laughs> it was, you, you know, so because of the way they just did it every year as a child growing up, you kind of just thought that's how things were like, oh yeah, the Braves just win the division because that's what the Braves do. It's the way it's always been. You're not and we're back to that it. again. I thought we did this already. We saw this movie. Um, <laughs> There's there's a few managers I I, I think I, I heard from your podcast with Adam uh, Dorowski. So you mentioned I think Jack McKean's name came up, Ch Ch Trader Jack, who again has just a one pennant in World Series, and because it was romantic that he was 73, I think, when they won the World Series. But I I, I don't I, I think that there's a good dividing line to say you got to draw the line someplace, right? And and you know, or else we're going to talk about Ron Washington, who went to consecutive World Series with the Rangers, you know, being a Hall of Fame candidate, and he's not. <laughs> yeah, and Jack McKean. Um, you know, he's 61st all time in games. Um, 50, he only has barely over a thousand wins, which is rather lean. Um, I'm pulling up my numbers, but the, the average hall of fame manager has won quite a more, uh, like a little, a shade under 2000. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I think he's a well-liked guy, but it's, uh, it's interesting. He, he's somebody he, in certain, if there was more people on a ballot, it's like nice to give a nod. Like, yeah. I love Charlie Manuel. I'm a Phillies fan. And he got on a ballot, I guess, the last time he was eligible. And I was like, really? I mean, I love him, but like, there's really not a whole, you know. But like, I appreciate that. I appreciate the nod. Like I can at least acknowledge like, okay, yeah, he gets a chance to be on the vote. I know he shouldn't get the vote, <laughs> but I'm glad at least he gets the opportunity. And there's advantages to having people like that because really when you have, let's say the eight, truly best candidates you get the situation where then the votes get spread across and you maybe get no one elected so you, you wonder that sometimes like in the last players uh ballot albert bell was on and it's like of all the people in post 1980 who could make this ballot like how does he get there and it's yeah you, it makes you wonder like do they sometimes put in a couple people that they know aren't really going to get votes so they have a better shot of like electing people because <laughs> certainly the Hall of Fame's caught a lot of heat in the years where no one gets elected. That's yeah. no fun. It doesn't help them their bottom line either. No, and 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 it also sets up bad. You know, we've talked about this on on the podcast that previously how you know it sets them up that there's a bunch of guys that are that are going to be coming in the next few years that are really obvious first ballot guys when they retire pool host is going to come up in a number of years and he will be in on the first ballot that he's you know eligible on same with guys like kershaw and verlander and scherzer like you've got some like slam dunk guys but those years it makes the ballot particularly brutal because if you end up with two or three of them on the same ballot people will just be like okay check off our two or three names our job is done we know we're putting some people in the hall of fame that year you know guys that should be getting a look don't quite get the same look that they should absolutely yeah, yeah and i and i think that you know you can look at uh the the players that are, are playing today and and in the managers you know that that are out there now you know bruce boshi who was on a uh on, on a track to uh you know be uh, in the hall of fame i think as a manager before he took the job in texas uh has only i think delayed it and and he did play and I, I checked bruce boshi today he played nine seasons of major league baseball for some reason in the middle of his career he didn't play one year in 1981 maybe he was hurt i i don't know uh but but gordon you uh, he did play for the mets and batted 306 in 1981 Oh, wow. to by far his best season so maybe that's why another reason is why i had that was a terrible mets team um so <laughs> why i i you know sort of have my eye on bruce boshi the whole time to the whole time the guy born in france um so he's he's probably the leading candidate he and, and dusty baker i would say of today's managers but i really look around and i don't really see other guys that are like yeah they're definitely going to get in <laughs> i think that they're the two biggest names uh, they're very high up on the wins list i think Dusty Baker getting that World Series is yes. going to make it really easier on the eventual voters on that committee when they see him. I think the other name that's maybe not truly at their level, but is really close, which again, to a 90s Phillies fan, just blows your mind how <laughs> things change is Terry Francona. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a too. kid, but like, so all you hear is, you know, the sports radio callers and they're bashing him. I look back and it's like, is that even a major league group of players that were on those teams? So, <laughs> what um, was he supposed? It was exactly. We, we've had that same conversation this season about you know is Buck a terrible manager or could literally nobody do anything with that bullpen because you're throwing out guys that aren't major league pitchers regularly? <laughs> yeah, and and Buck would be like 
the next guy who I think I think Francona eventually gets in the Hall of Fame once he's eligible. But like oh, yeah. that's where the line gets drawn. It's like it seems like Buck, if he can make something of this job oh. he has now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but man, the last couple of few months have really sort of changed the process. He's he's in Dusty Baker's last year's shoes before he won the World Series right now. I got to win one. I got to win one. Yeah, four manager of the years. Yeah, everybody thinks I'm this I'm a smart guy and all that stuff. Sorry, your playoff performance has not been good whether it's your fault or not. You better do something. I think if Francona had gotten over the line with the Indians, he would be in no doubt because breaking the Red Sox streak and the now Guardian streak would have just been like it would have been really hard to be the streak breaking manager for both teams and not get elected. But I think the still the strength of breaking the Red Sox curse will probably be enough to get him over the line, especially since they won more after that. And, and on that note, I mean, that's why one, whenever Theo Epstein becomes eligible, he just yep. gets a, a easy oh. stamp ticket because, yeah, he was part of two with the Red Sox and the <laughs> and the, the biggest, the two that everybody really knows, you know, the Guardians one only really became a thing when it came, you know, juxtaposed against the Cubs one. The, the Cubs curse and the Red Sox curse existed. Everybody knew about those if you even lightly followed baseball. And to show you how smart Theo is, he knew enough not to get another job running another team because when after you've done those two, what else are you going to do? And you know, and it, frankly, he's made a, a big impact in that last I read. He's, yeah. yeah, he's, con- he's con- consulting for Major League Baseball. And my understanding is he was very much the point person or a point person on these new rules and was a part of uh, the experimentation of them in the minor leagues and bringing them to the majors. And I, you know, I, somebody who knows history better than me can probably share, but like the suite of new rules that came into play in major league baseball this year is probably like more and more impactful than has happened in any given year in a very, very long time. And everybody, a lot of people are skeptical, but I think at this point, by and large, people are like pretty happy with it. And yeah. Theo Epstein seemingly deserves a bit of credit for that. I, mean, I, I got I got to think I... this is the the biggest rule change impact we've had since they lowered the mounds. I think that's probably the last time we've had this big an impact on the game by a set of rule changes. Yeah, I mean there's the DH, but yeah, I would take I would say the mound impacts first of all every everywhere, <laughs> every single pitch. <laughs> Yeah, be, before um, I wanted to talk about umpires because uh, you you meant we, we there's, there's ten of them in the Hall of Fame. Before I did that, um, a player I think uh, Dave we went back and forth a little bit when we mentioned Kurt Flood and and talk about a guy who I think and 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 Gordon I think you feel this way too that his contributions to the game and he was a good all star player, not a great ball player, but his contributions to the game uh, if 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 ever a guy was overlooked for a plaque in in, in Cooperstown, I think uh, Kurt Flo would be near the top of that list and, and when I think about my mental list, he's basically up there, and it's a shame he's one of these people who's gonna be tethered to a gigantic pool of candidates um competing for eight spots on a ballot of pre nineteen eighty every category people um really incredible player and yes i think um i i would love to see kurt plug in and it feels very overdue and i think marvin miller's eventual election really then becomes to me at least like well if marvin miller gets in you got to really put in kurt flood he really sacrificed his career here you did. um there's a lot of debate then because it's really that later case with messersmith and someone else where um things affect the change, but clearly Kurt Flood's actions. I think it was Dave McNally, right? Along. The two of them, Dave McNally yeah. and Messersmith. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with um, the free agency. Um, the, the, so umpires just for a second, um, because I, I, I heard you mentioned there's only 10 umpires in the hall of fame and that actually surprised me. Although, um, I, I it's sometimes it's hard to evaluate from the fans perspective, what makes an umpire. I think it's going to get even harder now. Well, and there you go, Gordon, exactly. You're on, you're on my, my, my uh, line here because with ABS, coming to a ballpark near you in the major leagues. And I, I think it's possible that could be next season, uh, even with the testing in the minor leagues uh, going going pretty well this year. Um, it's going to be even harder to evaluate an umpire in terms of his uh, ability to be a Hall of Famer. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Um, it's hard to even wrap my mind around how that will impact things, but because uh, I haven't personally seen how that comes into play, I've, uh, but there are only 10 umpires in. And zero from the Negro Leagues, which is unfortunate. And there's a couple people who uh, get discussed, but really there isn't a lot of 
a, a lot of talk. I mean, obviously, we're talking about umpires in the first place, which isn't the <laughs> the sexiest topic to most people. But, but at least there's only ten. You know, I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's fair. And a lot of them are from much earlier times. And the first two to get in were in 1953, um, when Tommy Connolly and Bill Clem got in, which were the two who w- you would put in. They had both been, you know, they worked the most games. Um, Tommy Connolly was talked about as sort of the archetypical, powerful umpire whose respect, he just commands respect by his presence. Bill Clem was a little louder and uh, a little bit more in that uh, type of guy. I'm pretty sure I remember t- reading Bill Clem's like rule book for baseball when I would umpire as a kid. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it was his like rule books and stuff they would have us study from while we were, you know, getting ready to do that for Little League and stuff. Probably. And you got to think about earlier days of history, the umpire had to deal with like a, a different type of discord and upset of like anger from play. I think players now, even though they can get a little fiery, it's a little more docile. Everyone's making a good living and just playing their game and, you know, checking their iPad to see like the numbers from analytics for the next at bat. But the, they had to really like keep order in a way that, doesn't really occur now there also was only one umpire on the field at a time or then later too so they had to like be calling balls and strikes behind the catcher and then calling plays down the line in like big games but um there's a few people i mean the big name who might make this next ballot joe west is of course now the owner of the record for most games umpired and when i've looked at what makes a hall of fame umpire umpiring a lot of games, umpiring a lot of World Series. Getting the chance to umpire a World Series seems to be, um, there's some sort of a rotation that clearly occurs, but you have to be quite respected by the league to get that opportunity. Um, And also for the earlier umpires, it's like if you were the first at something, and that, that stands for every category, being the first tends to carry a lot of weight. But um, Joe West... But as you know, like Joe West has a a certain reputation, which then makes you wonder, especially since almost every umpire who's gotten in, it only happened after they passed away. There's no rush to elect umpires. There's a tradition there. <laughs> but yeah, no, but nobody, nobody's beating down Cooperstown door to fight for umpiring. That would be interesting to have, though, though, while he's elected, have him, have him go to the induction because then that would follow that no umpire has ever been at the, the, the induction. It would be very stuff. interesting to hear his speech, certainly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and he loves to perform. Oh, yeah. He's a country singer and known as uh, Cowboy Joe West when he was umpiring, I think, uh, way back when. So, uh, uh, yeah. What about um, you mentioned in, in your podcast uh, pitching coaches and, and, and hitting coaches? And um, I think you mentioned Mel Stottlemyre and made me think of Dave Duncan. And then, uh, Gordon, I don't even know if you're familiar with these hitting coaches that were popular back in the, I think, the 80s and the 90s. Walt Riniak and Charlie Lau. Charlie oh, no. Charlie Lau oh, no. had a style where you would release the hand when you swung the bat, which is very sort of unusual. His you know one handed follow through, um, and there are a lot of disciples of Charlie Lau's hitting style, not the least of which I think was Wade Box um, at, at one point. So um, I, I just think that I, I never really thought about: gee, should pitching coaches or hitting coaches be in the Hall of Fame? Non managers be in the Hall of Fame? An interesting concept. Yeah, I, I it seems like a lot of people find it interesting and worthwhile. I mean. Because there aren't any, it's like hard to identify. At the same time, I think we all know certain starting points. Also, people like Mel Stottlemyre or Johnny Sane had very legitimate playing careers. So there's the Rule B element that would boost them anyway. Um, and Johnny Sane also has the fact he mentored Leo Mazzoni, who in his own right uh, was a very successful coach. But um, <laughs> Johnny Sane was you know i think most people just know spawn insane and pray for rain but um and spawn certainly overshadows him and reasonably but excellent pitcher um dave duncan yeah mazzoni there's quite a few duncan played in the majors um didn't have that long a career dave rigetti is another name Mm. um and then um yeah charlie lau's a name i hear a lot with hitting coaches uh davy lopes in terms of uh, first base, base coach. Yeah. I mean, gosh, for my Phillies, when they had their great run in 08 to 11 or so, 
Uh, I don't have the numbers at hand, but some of those teams had like the absolute best stolen base percentages of teams in history. And Davey Lopes was there at first. Clearly part of that is the players you have, but there, there's it's clear he must have made a big impact there. And uh, another just interesting name, Manny Moda, who, um, you know, you've got, he's like this all-time pinch hitter, but he was also a coach forever with the Dodgers for 34 years, which is the second longest coach wow. uh, tenure with a team ever. I the Dodger fans love when I was living in LA all those years ago. The Dodger fans love Manny Moda, and I don't know if the guy had twenty at bats in a season sometimes, you know. But he, <laughs> he he was a pinch hitter extraordinary, and all the fans loved him. And he did it until I swear he was in his forties, and he was still doing it, you know. So that that that, that kind of yeah. There's also guys like Don Zimmer who was like a baseball lifer, at, like to circle back to just rule be in general, mm-hmm. um, and he played everywhere around the world, and. He's in multiple team Hall of Fames. Um, and, you know, he seems like he made a real major impact on that Tampa franchise when it started. Um, he had a, some, a, he, I didn't even realize, just given, I guess, being, I'm going to call myself young, that he managed for 14 years. Uh, you know, for my lifetime, I just think of him sitting there in the Yankees dugout. Oh, yeah, that's kind of what I think of him as. <laughs> he was an original Met. Oh, yeah. The- Don okay. Zimmer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think it's interesting kind of looking at it as a lifetime sort of contribution of like this guy did so many things for the game of baseball that you just can't quantify. Like we've said, just by looking at, you know, numbers on a stat sheet, it's not just about hits and wins sometimes. Yeah, he also has, I mean, when people, if you look at Hall of Fame plaques, a lot of times towards the bottom, you get weird little notes like I think Larry McPhail's mentioned because he oversaw some winning clubs, but, uh, you know, was one of the first to have their teams fly on a plane or something like that. But like Don Zimmer, he got hit in the head with a pitch and that's when mandatory batting helmets came into play. That's Again, a pretty big, <laughs> I, I you know how much of, I'm not suggesting this necessarily a hall of fame case, but I think just this idea of this guy is all over baseball history. And, um, you know, maybe you don't think of him as getting a plaque next to Babe Ruth, but at the same time, the Hall of Fame, I think, is meant to honor baseball lifers and baseball careers. And again, as Rule B stated, um, it's overall contribution. Yeah, I think. Uh, go ahead. Go I think, ahead. in some ways, you know, you look at the Hall of Fame, and it's, you know, is is it a collection of just names, or is it supposed to sort of be a tapestry of the story of baseball? And sometimes you have somebody like Don Zimmer, where if you're really trying to tell the full story of baseball could you tell it without talking about Don Zimmer at some point, you know, you gotta, you can't, he would come up at some point. He was the guy that got hit in the head and now batting helmets are involved. That that's an undeniable fact. So I think that is something to look at when you're saying if you couldn't talk about the history of baseball without talking about this guy at some point, it's a good reason to probably think about their inclusion in the hall of fame. Yeah, well, the you know, and and you guys made the good point, uh, Dave. You did uh, first in terms of there's so many people going to be coming onto the ballot, so we can talk about all these guys, and it's just going to become more and more difficult for these. I don't want to call them you know, not every everyday names for a lot of people to have a chance to get into the Hall of Fame, and I and I feel like you know it's, there's not that many more people. You we could put you know another fifty people in the Hall of Fame. Would it really ruin it? You know to to, to, have, to have these stories talked about, and I think that's where I I differ from people that talk about the purity of the Hall of Fame and how it should be a sanct. You know, a, a sanctuary for only the greatest of the great or whatnot. I, I think you said it before. It's the history of the game, and we should tell the story. I really encourage, I don't know the name of the book offhand. I mean, there's probably a couple of books that really talk about the origin of the creation of the Hall of Fame. And I think the better you learn that story, the less you're able to think that this is some sacrosanct place that fell (laughs) from the heavens into rural New York, as opposed to a very uh, well thought out enterprise by a bunch of capitalists to try to market the game or sell their wares or promote this hamlet of Cooperstown, given the the industries or the leaders in Cooperstown who wanted it there, who then contrived um, narratives about the history of baseball to try to make its centrality in, as coming from this town. So just all in all, it's always been, it's a marketing endeavor. They're connected to the Major League Baseball without technically being tied to it. 
And I think that it's always can be what we want to make of it in terms of who gets the plaques. But at least according to the rules, there's those four categories with a fuzzy pioneer element to the uh, executives. And at least for this coming cycle, it's going to be a relatively small pool of likely names. Yeah. Yeah, the, well, on July 23rd, right, we've got the induction this year. Um, two players going in, uh, Scott Rowland, and he's going to be wearing a Cardinals hat, and I guess I should ask the Phillies fan, how does that make you feel? I um, I get it. Um, <laughs> he's got uh, people around here. Boy, Phillies fans can hold a grudge. I don't know if that shocks you, but. No, in any <laughs> <you> way. <know. laughs> Again, another one of these things where I was whatever age, 12 or something, when he left, and everyone got angry. But, you know, the these players that get drafted, they're held with that team for many years with no real recourse to change teams. There was no good reason on his part to think that they were going to start to be competitive. Um, there was some challenging um, <laughs> beefs, let's say, that occurred when it came to how manager Larry Boa was speaking of him and handling, and he wanted to, he wanted to change. And I'm very much in when it comes to say Kurt Flood. It's you know. Yep. I mean, I can it, change employers by leaving my job. And if some if a player wants to, they should be able to. And so I think it's great Scott Rollins in. I'm excited that he'll eventually make the Phillies. They call it the wall of fame here. Um, but yet uh, there's so many Phillies fans are so upset that Scott Rollins getting on the wall of fame. And it's like, gosh, we don't have that much winning history. Like, <laughs> let's just take it. This guy was amazing to watch. It was such a blessing to have him during those lean years. I think the fact that people are still angry to this day speaks even more to the reason why Kurt Flood needs to be in the Hall of Fame because he fought for something that makes people popular with nobody. And that was very important for baseball because it changed the game for the better. And I think we all know that. <laughs> the um the other guy who's going in is Fred McGriff, and I noticed that he won't be going in with wearing any logo on his cap, which is quite interesting. So uh, you know, and I and I, I kind of think that's a little bit, you know, him saying, Yeah, well, if you if one of you guys would have taken one of you teams would have taken care of me, I'd wear your damn cap. But you <laughs> didn't, so I'm not gonna wear a Padres cap or a Rays cap or anything like that, or a Braves cap for that matter. Um, but what what is interesting is is that as much as you know these these other players that were elected to the hall of fame and other people elected they all show up in cooperstown and sit in the chairs in the 94 degree heat sweating like crazy to watch the, and and if you see the way they interact with one another i think that's one of the coolest thing about that that makes you know that it's more to these guys it than means it is. a lot to the players right 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 yeah and that's why you see i think the players once they're in I don't think they're that eager to add. Like, I wonder <laughs> when these players are the voters on Good these point. committees. Like, I get a, uh, I won't name a name, but uh, I think there's certain players who it's clear, like, they're just, they're going to hold quite a high standard for the next Hall of Famer, even if that standard is higher than what their career was. But on the point of Fred McGriff, I wanted to pull it up because I remember when uh, the voting was happening that I was shocked by this, um, at least in terms of wins above replacement. Uh, I mean, I always think of him as a Brave, like I think most primarily do. 11.1 wins above replacement as a Brave, 19.4 as a Blue Jay. Now, I think that's because of a couple of especially great years, but I think that surprises people. And even as a Padre, nine and a half, which is only a couple less than Atlanta. Obviously, he had the playoff success with Atlanta, but it makes a lot of sense in a way for him to go blank. Well, and, and you mentioned, um, you know, the, the way that you can get popularity contests and the voting. And I, I looked at the Contemporary uh, Era Baseball Committee, uh, which had the following people. And it made me think, who's going to get voted in? Greg Maddox, Jack Morris, Ryan Sandberg, Lee Smith, Frank Thomas, and Alan Trammell are the players. There's there's obviously executives and media and historians. And I'm thinking, gee, there's a couple of Cubs in there, Greg Maddox and Lee Smith uh, and Ryan Sandberg. I, I wonder what Cubs they might think. Well, let's get one of our teammates, maybe Mark. Mark Gray should be in the Hall of Fame or, or or something like that because you have the opportunity to do that. Traditionally, in, in this in, in this area, that has happened. Absolutely. I mean, I so is that the group that they were on the committee this past year? Yeah, I, they're the 2023 Contemporary Era Baseball Committee. So, right, uh, so that was this past year. It's always confusing because the voting happens right. the year before. Right. And I, it confuses me, even though it's really not that complicated of a concept. But You're um, always talking about the it, it happens the year before, but it's named for the year it right. was, and, it, it's, it's being voted on for. And I believe on that committee, Chipper Jones was supposed to be on it, but like 
he had some travel issue the day before and he couldn't get there. So that's an additional brave voice. Um, obviously McGriff got in anyway. Um, but yeah, we definitely, it's so obviously apparent. I mean, Harold Baines is the one everyone talks about, which look, the guy was a really good player. It's exhausting how people just want to knock the fact that he's in to me at least. But, um, I, that's one of those things where it's like uh, sort of the smoke-filled room that we don't know. We don't get to know much of what happens there. But yeah. gosh, it would be so cool to know. And I think be a that, fly like, on that wall. <laughs> I think like minutes are recorded. I forget. I've read up on like the other people who get to be in the room. And I think there's probably information in an archive at Cooperstown that would be really cool if we ever get to see it but i wouldn't count on it it just to hear how the players evaluate each other would be so interesting to hear how the hall of fame pitchers would look at a hitter and the hall of fame hitter would look at a pitcher because they would have or nobody would be like it would just be like i always remember how hard he was to get out or now he wasn't that good you know they would definitely have opinions like that and it could be when in that other player's career they faced him could have Mm -hmm. been like yeah at the end of their career or um, but there's out and out lobbying. We know, you know, back in the day with people, you know, saying you know, strong arming him to voting for him and backroom dealing and stuff like that. <laughs> and I assume it still goes on today to to whatever degree. And uh, and because we mentioned the Cubs there, I'm actually surprised that Mark Grace's name didn't come up more uh, with those uh, guys on the uh, Veterans Committee uh, uh, last year. Well, so those players, they they sort of receive the ballot. And that's the other thing. I don't really I don't know exactly. There's like a committee that creates the ballot. Yep, but um, there's a yeah, selection committee. There's a the selection the, committee that, that and I would curate that. <laughs> I would love to hear though how the players who were on the voting committee, like, gosh, because uh, the Bonds and Clemens is of the world really got so few votes, and that shocked me. But I guess those players really weren't yeah. keen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's that's something we can talk about another time, yeah. maybe, Dave, because we could go <laughs> down that. We we would be all, all over. More that than happy to go down that rabbit hole. Similar. <laughs> well, um. I think that's I think that's great. I think uh, I think we have a lot here for the the folks that listen. Um, I, I I thought about talking about Bill James for a second because I think that's just a good name to throw out there. Going okay, he didn't play, but he had a giant impact on the game for a long time, and he was in the front office of the Red Sox at one point, obviously. Um, and I think we need to think about the game in its entirety. And I think that's what the Rule B thing does. It's just going to be sad that there's going to be such a limited opportunity for some of these names. I think, oh yeah, what about a guy like that? Yeah, uh, he's like on my short list, like for this potential uh, ballot, like Pinella, St- I'm, I'm not a big Steinbrenner fan, but Steinbrenner's kind of the top owner that you're likely to see post-1980. Brian Sabian would have been a, a major executive mm-hmm. pick, but it's a little unclear if he now won't be eligible because of his role with uh, the Yankees. Is that I think he's employed I, I, of some yeah. kind. So. Uh, mm-hmm. and Bill White, Felipe Alou. Roland Heeman is someone I'm really keen on, which isn't a name as many people are familiar with. So I encourage people to look up Roland Heeman. Um, Bruce Framing and uh, Joe West are really the two likely umpires. And it's also important to remember when it comes to this ballot that's going to be coming our way, you're going to see a mix of these categories. So expect at least one umpire. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, we, I, I really think we could have 11. We could have 11. Yeah. <laughs> it would be okay. <laughs> yeah. And then for me, I, I, I think the Philly Fanatic should be in. <laughs> I, I, you know, we're going to do an episode on, on mascots. And I wrote, I think I wrote down today going, okay, so the first mascot was Mr. Met, but I think Mr. Met's just a weird mascot, even though it's my team. And I, and Mm. I, I I think it's a, it's just kind of like, it seems like truly from another era, whereas the other things seem to hold the test of time better to me. Uh, The Philly fanatic and the San Diego chicken would probably be the other two that I'd I'd put up there. So yeah, the fanatic is, is what's great about baseball. The fanatic feels like an actual mascot where Mr. Matt, I don't know. There's something kind of creepy. (laughs) I think I feel the same way. Is that how Mets fans generally feel about Mr. Matt? Probably not. I think we're we're heretics to Met fans by saying that we don't love. And now there's Mrs. Met, which is just even more bizarre. Um, So I I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know, this but there's uh the fanatic's mom no no i did not know that <laughs> yes uh she shows up for mother's day and maybe his birthday it's somehow there's always a game on the fanatic's birthday and it's not the same day every year but <laughs> well okay um, with it. david we've, we've enjoyed talking with you um i think we could probably do a, a whole nother uh episode just talking about some of the guys that didn't get in that we think you know should have that really... consideration um so uh if it's all right with you we'll we'll stay in touch and we'll, we'll have you back another time Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. Thanks, David.